Throughout history, from the ancient times of Pythagoras and St. Francis of Assisi, through to Charles Darwin and Albert Schweitzer, there have always been individuals who had high regard for the lives of animals, who wrote and spoke out in their defence. Now, for the first time, there's a mass popular movement. It's growing rapidly, and like the women's movement, looks set to transform the world this century. Animals deserve to live their lives free from persecution, just as humans do. But unlike previous movements, animals cannot liberate themselves. All changes in society have been brought about by people getting angry, getting up and fighting for it. Slavery was brought about by a mass popular movement. Women's rights uh, was brought about by, yet again, another mass popular movement, people becoming active. What happens to them is, is unbelievably cruel, unbelievably vicious, and I believe that you have to fight. You have to fight very, very hard to stop it. We seem to think that just because we're of a different species, we can treat them as we like. People who are particularly violent or cruel to animals may go on and become violent to human beings. has shown that animals have been subjected to the most inhumane treatment. They have been regarded as inferior and having no rights. Dr. Richard Ryder is a clinical psychologist and was one of the founders of the modern animal liberation movement. Animals have always been terribly important for human beings in, in, in our art, in our religion, in mythology, folklore, but also, of course, in our economics and in what we eat. Um, so animals have always been central. A lot of people talk about it as if it's a sort of... Um, a peripheral issue, but it's really very central to the whole psychology of the human species. So why are we cruel to animals? Violence is actually pretty basic in not only all human beings, but most other animals too. Got to yeah. take control. That's the it. Controls might, might sometimes mingle. No! 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 Under certain circumstances, we are wired up to behave in a fairly dominant way. For example, in, in, in self-defense. In the 21st century, we rarely need to defend ourselves from animals, yet there continues to be large-scale cruelty towards them. The major cruelties of the 20th century, uh, animal experimentation, factory farming, uh, the increased uh, exploitation of wildlife, all these things were allowed to develop and get worse, and nobody really challenged them until, in, in, in Europe, until um, the 1960s in the 1970s and then suddenly this whole issue became alive again and we saw this revival of concern about the moral relationship between humans and non-humans. Uh, 
I think to be fair, um, some people turn a blind eye to it because it's not very clear to see. When people can see animals suffering, they are concerned. This is why the role of television has been very important in bringing to people's attention what animals are suffering at human beings' hands. If people do see suffering, they do tend to be concerned about it. But, of course, there are very good reasons very often for being cruel to animals, like this money in it. It's a part of a commercial operation. People think we need animals for various purposes. And people get used to things. People get inured. It becomes a sort of habit. The animal rights movement is an all-encompassing set of theories and practices. It is not just about signing petitions or disrupting fox hunts. It's about abolishing all cruelty and unnecessary exploitation of animals. It's about upholding the due respect given to all living creatures, no matter what their species. this hard and fast line down the species barrier between our species and other species. It seemed to be just an irrational prejudice like racism or sexism. So I coined the word speciesism, partly to bring this home to people, to make them realise that it's a nonsense. There are no very good reasons for treating non-human animals in a different way from the way that we're supposed to treat other human beings. It doesn't matter whether they reason or not, and how, or how intelligent they are. The question is, can they suffer? And as science develops, so there's more and more evidence that animals can suffer pain and distress in the same sort of way that, that we can. that animals have feelings. Like us, they love and they suffer. They have a basic need to live according to their inherited nature and to socialize with others of their own kind. Charles Darwin said, emotions and faculties such as love, memory, curiosity and reason may be found well developed in animals. After Charles Darwin, um, who, as you know, in about 1860, put out his idea that we're all related through e evolution, that human beings are animals, um, it's like the moral implications of that message hadn't yet really been realised. Finally, the penny is beginning to drop, that if we're all related through evolution, we should be also related 
morally. Only recently, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declared that each person is equal in all aspects of society and the law. A further step forward was taken when the Declaration of Animal Rights was drafted in 1978, paving the way for a mass movement in defence of animals. No animal should be ill-treated or subjected to cruel acts. All wild animals had the right to liberty in their natural environment. All companion animals have the right to complete their natural lifespan. Abandoning an animal is a cruel and degrading act. Animal experimentation involving physical or psychological suffering is incompatible with the rights of animals. No animal should be exploited for the amusement of man. Any act involving the slaughter of animals is a crime against life. Defenders of animal rights should have an effective voice at all levels of government. It's a very well reasoned movement. The theory is extremely well developed. But of course you need more than that. You need to learn how to put those moral theories into practice. To me, it's anybody who does something for the animals, something active, where either, even if it's writing a letter, signing the petition, um, that's all um, an activity to end animal suffering. But people go further and, you know, animal rights activists are normally people who go and rescue animals and do something like direct action to, to directly save animals' lives. Heather James was one of the coordinators of the campaign that closed down Hillgrove Cat Farm, vivisection breeders. I see it as I have everything, I have my freedom, I can see who I want, I can be with who I want, I can eat what I want, I can sleep when I want to, and the animals don't have any freedom at all, the animals in the laboratories, the factory farms, they don't have any of that. So I've got it, and I have the power to make a difference, to make changes, which we have done already. And I will keep using that for as long as I live. I'll never, ever do anything else. Animal rights activist Neil Johnson leads a hunt sabbing workshop. It's absolutely vital and crucial that if you have any subs down here, they stay tight together. They make no noise whatsoever. Animal rights is a fundamental part of civilised society. Um, there is no logical reason why nowadays we should chase a hunted animal to death just for our own enjoyment. That is absolute textbook perfect savvy. Some situations you can't do that. Some places it's too dangerous from a physical point of view. There's no need at all why we should use animals for food, for entertainment values, or to make money out of them. All animal abuse, really, and human abuse, and the damage to the environment and the planet, all these things concern me very, very deeply, but particularly animal rights, because I see them as totally innocent victims. Animal welfare, such as the work that sanctuaries do and animal welfare societies, is excellent work, and it directly helps animals who are suffering, so it is necessary. But um, you can be seen as mopping up 
um, a huge problem and we have to address the actual problem rather than the symptoms of the problem and you have to stop the abuse at the root. So for instance, greyhound racing, greyhound rescue are absolutely fantastic, rescuing greyhounds is absolutely essential, but what we've got to do in the long term is stop greyhound racing. So if you think something's cruel, if you think you should actually do something to stop that cruelty, then you've got to do it and you've not got to rely on anybody else to do it for you. valuable thing that anybody can do for struggle for animal rights is to become vegetarian or become vegan. Straight away you're cutting out that cruelty from your own lifestyle and then once you've addressed that issue on a personal level then and only then should you really start looking about how you can better the rest of society. rights activists tend to be vegetarian or vegan. They have chosen to reduce or omit animal products from their diet and lifestyle. There's no necessity to eat animals. People can live extremely healthy, good, active lifestyle without the need for killing animals for whatever reason, be it meat, be it for their skins. But I think, thank goodness, compassion is in all of us. Sometimes it gets a bit stifled. Uh, sometimes it's uh, people are frightened to show it. Sometimes it's overlaid with other feelings. But there is a compassionate spark in all of us. It's natural to us. And that's a very good thing. Uh, what we have to do is try to be uh, confident enough to, to show this towards other people and towards um, animals as well. Anything you can do to relieve that suffering to me is, is absolutely necessary and I think it's our duty to do that. This is disgusting, I'm not having it, I am standing up for it. Animal rights campaigners are at the forefront of an ever-changing society. Their campaigns reduce the consumption and demand for animal products and create the need for animal-free alternatives. You can choose to live a cruelty-free life. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand you. What you
so hurt.